with the microphone being turned on. I'm going to start with a poem. And it's a poem, actually, that band, that band had passion. I think that band had passion. You could tell that they had found it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Finding your passion. There's been a lot of talk at TED about how important it is to, to live your passion, but not too much on how to find it. So that's my story. But first, the poem. It's by Charles Bukowski. It's called The Laughing Heart. Your life is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Be on the watch. There are ways out. There is a light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. Be on the watch. The gods will offer you chances. Know them. Take them. You can't beat death, but you can beat death in life sometimes. And the more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are a marvelous, the gods want to delight in you. I'm going to start with a story after that poem. And the story has to do with has to do with the passion as a gift. Most of us don't know what our passion is. It's a gift to get passion in your life. This little girl she probably knew that she wanted to be a veterinarian at a very early age. She uh, loved everything about horses. She rode horses. She probably competed. She studied. She was a veterinarian. She loved her life. And then she died completely fulfilled and happy. Most of us don't get that. Most of us maybe have an inkling of what it is that we love and that we're passionate about. So how do we find that? Well, one of the ways is to go back to childhood. I uh, have always had an interest in books, nothing too crazy. But I asked my father once if he could kind of enlighten me as to why Books are so important to me. And he told me the story of how one day he came back from work, entered his study, and found this humongous tower of books, his books, from his shelves on the floor. And there I was, sitting in this igloo with the greatest smile he'd ever seen in his life on my face. So that told me something. He also told me about when they used to have friends over. Again, I used to go to the bookshelves. I used to select specific books. This was when I was two or three years old. And put them on the laps of various people who came to visit us. I, uh, I've also... When, uh, when I did that, he also used to take me to bookstores, all sorts of old bookstores. And I guess what I might have breathed in was some of the calm or joy that he felt in those stores. And he used to bring the books back home. And I think, again, the place that they had in his heart and his home, I absorbed that. Well, when I... Got into my teens, I, again, it wasn't such a big deal. Books weren't that 
important to me. I, I used to go out and, and get some penguin paperbacks and put them on a little bookshelf in my bedroom, but uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't the most important thing in my life back then. The most important thing back then was actually getting drunk and chasing girls uh, unsuccessfully most of the time. I, uh, yeah, that's the unsuccessful young man. <laughs> and it's uh, not surprising that he was unsuccessful, I guess. Uh, anyway, so the rest, uh, the rest of, the, of the teenage years were spent doing normal things like going to university. I started in a sales job. I, uh, I, I was in the printing business and I had some fun there and sort of explored that. Went, to, got a master's degree, uh, and married a beautiful wife and had a beautiful family. I also had a successful business. I uh, kind of figured out what I like to do. I like to write. I like to sell. I like to try and synthesize information and persuade people to do what I wanted them to do. And uh, so, as I say, had a successful, successful business. At the same time, I jumped ahead with the slides here. At the same time, I, uh, I nurtured an interest in Canadian prime ministers. I went after books about them, memoirs. I even got a signed copy of uh, John Diefenbaker's memoir and was really thrilled about that until I found out that the, uh, the books that he hadn't signed were actually rarer. <laughs> I, uh, I then came across uh, a book called The Lifetime Reading Plan and uh, really started to pay attention to fiction. I hadn't up until about the age of 30. This was a, this was a, a wonderful book. It lists the, what he thinks are the hundred most important books of fiction, novels ever written, and so I used to race home from work to get into the world of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and uh, I'd recommend that thoroughly. So I, I knew, and then, and then it got kind of a little bit more crazy. I read a book about collecting books and started to collect first editions and books with interesting dust jackets with specific illustrators and this gave me a whole new reason to go to all those bookstores that I love to go to uh, to find and hunt down more books. In fact, Chapters had a sale on, uh, this was when Heather Reisman first bought the company and uh, they were selling baskets of books for 20 bucks each. And I uh, decided that uh, I would approach the manager to see if I couldn't get a better deal than that. And they let me down in the basement. And so I came out with a gigantic pallet full of books, brought them home and put them on the internet. This was early, early stages, so not everyone else had thought to do that. And I made seven or eight hundred bucks a month just doing that, and I put that money, yes, into other books. And so, when we moved into this big house that we bought, I built a room over the garage with a gigantic bookshelf in it so that I could display all the books. Went downstairs, built a ton more shelves in the basement to put all the books that I got from chapters on. So, I want just at this point to say that everything was going really well. And this would have been, this would have taken me into my mid 40s. At which point I fell rather dramatically into Dante's Dark Forest. It, uh, it was not a happy time. I couldn't function, I couldn't, I couldn't even think. I, I didn't, believe it or not, care about books. And it took a, it took a good couple of years before I kind of came out of this existential, barren crisis that basically said, is this all there is? But what happened was that I 
very slowly started to crawl, just like I was when I was a two-year-old in the, my dad's study, toward books. And I started blogging about them and writing about books. And what happened was I got to a point where I had to make a decision. And that decision was, do I go back doing what I did before? Do I get a job? Do I act responsibly? Do I have books as a hobby? Or do I throw myself into it entirely? Do I live my passion? And a whole bunch of little things happened, a little coincidences, and I just want to convey to you one. I was, we were separating, my wife and I. I'd seen the place that I wanted to move into. I, I liked it. I looked up to heaven and said, boy, wouldn't it be good if God could come down and give you a big hug? Wouldn't it be good if he could make you feel as good as you feel after having sex? Wouldn't that just fill the churches? Uh, and then I thought, well, how does he communicate with us? And this was a calm day, and suddenly the wind just picked up and blew in my face, and I thought, this was a calm day. I think I mentioned that. And it just blew in my face, and I thought, well, he, commi he, he communicates through the wind. And I went for a walk around the block, and I came across an old guy who was taking out boxes and stuff for a garage sale. And I went down into the garage, and I took out these boxes, and they had books in them. And the first book that I saw on top of the box was entitled, How Does God Communicate With Us? And I flipped the book over, and on the back side it said, there were six reasons. The first reason was through the wind. Now, I could have gone into the priesthood then, but I chose, I chose to take this as a message that books were where it was at. And so I, I lived the passion. I decided, okay, I'm going to set up a, a radio show on books. I approached a local radio station. I started writing about books. I just, just sort of lived it. I, I traveled around. I, I interviewed some of the greatest and have interviewed some of the best authors in the world. Publishers, uh, fine press owners, printers, booksellers. I've just done everything I wanted to do with books and I've created, I've traveled around and I've created, I've created something. I've created articles, I've created interviews. And uh, it wasn't that, it's not that easy. What I'm, I guess the message I want to convey to you is that I, the, the part of, of living your passion is, first of all, you want to create something with it, and then you can do something with that. And, but once you've, once you've done that and you want to try and turn it into something that'll earn you a living, it's a slog. It's not easy. It's not the secret. The secret is the slog. But if you're passionate about it, passionate about what it is you're slogging through, it's not gonna be so difficult. It'll help you to discover who you are. It'll help you to Make it through the tough times, and uh, it'll also uh, help you to discover who you are. I'm a collector, I'm a writer, I'm an interviewer, and I've discovered that I'm a literary tourist, which is the website that I've just set up. And I hope to share my passion with others through this website. So in closing, I'd urge you all to... Search for the light. Look for Bukowski's light. And as a result, your life will be marvelous.
Thank you.